Okay, so I'm going to tell you about a, a uh, construction that I came up with last year that's about the Fukai category and how it changes under symplectic quotients. And I'll start by telling you or reminding you what a symplectic manifold is. This is a, an even dimensional smooth manifold with a closed and non degenerate two form. So you can think of a, a real surface with an area form, or you can think of a smooth projective complex variety. There's a distinguished kind of submanifold called Lagrangian, which is an, a submanifold of half the ambient dimension on which omega, the symplectic form, vanishes. So in the case of a real surface, that's just a, that's just a curve. In the case of a smooth, complex uh, projective variety, the real locus is a Lagrangian. Now, there's an important invariant of a symplectic manifold called the Fukaya category. And roughly, this tracks the Lagrangians inside of our symplectic manifold M and an intersection theory of those Lagrangians that's um, enhanced by some pseudo-holomorphic curve information. So a little more specifically, this is almost a category. It's an A-infinity category, but forget that. The objects are Lagrangians, or maybe some class of Lagrangians. And for any Lagrangians L and K, the morphisms are formal sums of intersection points as long as L and K intersect transversely. And the place that this gets interesting is when you try to define composition. So you take uh, two morphisms between Lagrangians L0, L1, L2, and we need to define the composition. And so it's enough to be able to write down the coefficient of an intersection of L0 and L2 in this composition. And we define that by counting some uh, pseudo-holomorphic maps. So basically, holomorphic maps. It turns out that there's always a um, complex structure on the tangent bundle of M that's somehow suited to omega. You fix that. You look at maps from a disk that are holomorphic with respect to that structure, um, which satisfy boundary conditions in L0, L1, L2 and send those distinguished three points to A, B, and C. Uh, so I've drawn the domain of this map here with the parts of the domain labeled by the things that they map to. And if you'd rather think about the image, the image would look something like this. So this is a um, quite rich invariant, and it's been computed in many cases. Um, but something that makes it less convenient than you would like and kind of hard to manipulate is that there's not an obvious definition of an obvious notion of um, functoriality or naturality uh, evident from the definition. So just like, for instance, singular homology is functorial with respect to continuous maps. You'd like some equivalent notion for, or some analogous notion for Fukai categories. Uh, so almost 10 years ago, Mao, Verheim, and Woodward uh, showed that actually there is a, uh, a sort of naturality that the Fukai category obeys. So they showed that if you have a Lagrangian in a product, AKA a Lagrangian correspondence, that gives rise to a functor between the Fukai categories. And um, on the object level, it's, it's pretty straightforward. You basically pretend that your correspondence L12 is the graph of a symplectic embedding. Um, and so to push forward a Lagrangian in, M in M1, you take the fiber product over M1 of L1 and L12. Uh, and then you push that forward with the projection to M2. And generically, you get a Lagrangian in M2. Uh, and then the place that this gets interesting is what happens on the morphism level. So just as to, to define composition in the Fukai category, 
we counted pseudohomorphic triangles. Here we're going to count some, some other kind of pseudohomorphic object. But here, instead of just a map, it's what's known as a pseudohomorphic quilt. So this is a pair of maps, and I've drawn the domain here. Uh, so we require two maps, one from the yellow loon to M1, and one from the red disk to M2. Um, the yellow map satisfies ordinary Lagrangian boundary conditions in your domain Lagrangians. And the, uh, the interesting thing is how these maps are linked together. So I labeled that circle on the, I labeled that smaller circle by the Lagrangian correspondence, and that's what links the maps together. So what you require is that um, for every point in that circle, you can hit that either with the yellow map or the red map, and if you pair those images up, you get a point in M1 times M2, and you require that to live in the in L12. So that, that red circle is not inside. The red disk is not inside the yellow disk. Is it a part of it? Well, I've partitioned the, the big disk into two pieces. Oh, okay. So this is a, to me, beautiful and very general construction. But so far, after 10 years, there's only one computation of it. And uh, so last year, I was thinking, wouldn't it be great if we had some kind of even moderately general way of computing these functors? Um, and I was particularly hoping for some kind of um, really hands-on way of doing that, so some kind of way of explicitly cooking up these pseudo-homorphic quilts. So that's what I'll tell you about in the next bit. So to tell you about, about this context, I should tell you about this notion of symplectic reduction. So say that G is a Lie group that acts on M by Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms. And it doesn't really matter what that means. It's just the right notion of a group action on a symplectic manifold. So you can then form this symplectic quotient, which is again a symplectic manifold. And one example would be if you let S1 act on CP2 by rotating the last coordinate, the symplectic quotient is CP1. And one nice thing about this is that um, symplectic quotienting always comes with a Lagrangian correspondence between M and M mod G. I won't tell you the general definition, but in this case, um, in this case of S1 acting on CP2, um, here's the correspondence you get between CP2 and CP1. And so Mao, Verheim, Woodward tell you how to produce functors from correspondences, so you can try to use this to relate Fuq of M and Fuq of M mod G. And um, so I thought about this last year in the case of CP1 and CP2, and I came up with a way of doing that which is, I think, somewhat general, and that's what I'm going to what I'm going to tell you about now. So I'll give you an example of this construction. There's this question that Ockfeld, Kanish, De Silva, and Verheim raised in 2013. So they said, consider this functor between CP2 and CP1. There's some algebraic reason why you should expect a, a pseudo-homorphic quilt like the one I represented here. So um, the only part I didn't tell you about so far is L, which is a Lagrangian in CP2 called the Anaconish Lagrangian, and it's basically RP2. So the question was, you expect this thing for abstract reasons, find it. And um, I was thinking about this last year actually something closely related to it, not quite this. And I made some progress and I got stuck. And I eventually reduced cooking this quilt up to solving the system of quadratic equations, arbitrarily many of them in arbitrarily many variables over the reals. <laughs> uh, so I thought, OK, great. This is what people who do real algebraic geometry do all day. So I went to Janusz Kolar, and I said, hey, do you know how to solve this? 
And he said, don't waste your time. <laughs> so I gave up. I figured if, if Janos Kolar says you can't do it, then you definitely can't do it. And I mean, of course, he was right about the question I asked him. So a couple days later, I went to the dining hall, and I was late, so the math table was full. So I saw Mark Doreski sitting at a little table by, this, by the side. I sat down next to him, and I told him about this problem and how I was stuck and I was giving up. And he thought about it for a minute, and he said, so the domain of your problem is the disk. Well, I guess the disk is biholomorphic to the upper half plane. So, so you can transform that problem to this problem, everything's invariant under this uh, biholomorphism of the domain. And I went home and I thought about it, and it made this issue of this horrible system of equations totally go away. And I was actually able to uh, just write down an answer to that question. <laughs> and if you want to try to think about it for yourself, close your eyes, because I'll, I'll show the answer. It's kind of a fun exercise. So there it is. And it uses the deep mathematical fact that 2 times 5 squared is equal to 7 squared plus 1 squared. Um, so I thought that was pretty cool. Um, and so I, I like this, I guess, for two reasons. For one thing, it's not just applicable in this case. Um, I think it should apply to more general examples of comparing Fuku of M and Fuku of M mod G. And for another thing, this is the first explicit example of something called figure eight bubbling, which is what half of my thesis was about. So that part was not vacuous. Woohoo. Um, yeah, so um, so this year, something I'd like to think about is um, more general examples of M and M mod G, um, where you can relate their Fukai categories using this construction. Um, and I think I might start by the smallest generalization, which is um, what happens when um, when M is some complex surface other than CP2. Uh, and if anyone wants to think about this with me, I'd love to do that. So thank you. <laughs>